Hi, everybody. This is Jack Jezreel with Just Faith Ministries. And today, I think we've got a special treat in store. Over the last few months, prompted by the murders of George Floyd and uh, Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor here in Louisville, by the way, uh, there has been um, the largest conversation that I can remember about race, about really white people waking up to the racism that abounds. And so my guest uh, today is a good good friend of mine, actually, um, John Borders. John uh, and I met, gosh, John, it, 20 years ago, I suppose, or so. I was yeah. buying my first little farm outside of Louisville, and you were the closing attorney, and we didn't even know each other then. <laughs> and, um, and then it would be many years before we would reconnect. John actually uh, was a significant character uh, at the time that I was diagnosed with cancer. And we connected John then, and, um, and, it, and I think we became uh, good friends as a, partly a consequence of that experience. And over the years, John and I have attended the same church for a while, and we've connected on all sorts of fronts. So another common passion that John and I have is uh, vegan food. And whenever John invites me to his house for a vegan Thank meal, you. I am all in because he's a fabulous right. cook. Uh, John is married to Cindy, and they have three kids. John's a real estate attorney, as I mentioned. And um, John, welcome. It's great to be chatting with you today. Thank you, Jack. I really appreciate the invitation to be here. Uh, one thing you left out in our history is that oh. I also bought vegetables from you many oh, that's years right. ago. That's right. I yeah. used to be a farmer. I could get a CSA. That's right. <laughs> that's right. John never complained about how bad the tomatoes were, but uh, <laughs> that just speaks to his patience. Uh, John, uh, inside the social justice community, there's a common phrase, you know, getting woke which yeah. refers to those who haven't heard that phrase. Uh, it's like how, becoming aware, maybe for the first time, to something that you hadn't seen before, it's some kind of issue that just wasn't on your radar screen. And suddenly you see it and you can't believe you never saw it, but now yeah. you do see it. You realize it's going to in some ways craft my life going forward. And I know you've got sort of a woke up story and I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share a little bit about your background and kind of some things that happened to you that got you woke to the issue of racism. Sure, absolutely. So I have two stories of, of getting woke as it relates to racism uh, and very different, um, a big time span between the two. I was raised uh, in a conservative household, a conservative Catholic household. Um, Lots of love, but not a lot of conversation about the suffering that was happening in the world. Not a lot of conversations about poverty, not a lot of conversations about people living on the margins and being left out. Um, so that uh, is how I lived my life until I went to law school. And then for whatever reason in law school, my mind and my heart were opened uh, to uh, the suffering of other people. And, uh, and, I, and I distinctly remember watching a movie called Cry Freedom. And this is the story of Stephen Biko, who was an activist in South Africa who was murdered uh, in, in prison and was one of countless people murdered in prison in South Africa under, under the apartheid system. I watched that movie and, and I watched it with, with my parents and I was, stunned by what I saw. Like I, I couldn't believe that this was happening as I sat there in my parents' living room that that that, that there, were, there were people being murdered in prison in South Africa because of the color of their skin. And so that really awakened in me a an understanding um, that there was uh, a whole world about. Um, I, I combined, so my, my sort of social justice awakening was that movie, uh, having my younger brother whom I adore come out as a gay man, and also reading a book by John Robbins called Die for Numerica, which tied our, the way we eat to issues of animal suffering 
and uh, also to environmentalism and health. And three things really kind of shook me to my core, uh, but, but, but it was really the, the movie that really kind of, kind of woke me up. And, you know, but so my, my all-time favorite movie, just as an aside, my all-time favorite movie is Gandhi. And, uh, and so I watched Gandhi when I was in college and I was completely unmoved by it. Uh, I watched The Killing Fields when I was in college and I was completely unmoved by it. And, and so, you know, it, it's astounding to me that I am the same person that I was then. Uh, but I am, and and so I, you know, I think that holds out hope for all of us that that our, our minds and our hearts can be awakened. Um, so so then let's fast forward. And so I've been involved with Habitat for Humanity, and so I've, I've for almost thirty years I've done closings for Habitat and, and a lot of volunteer legal work, and I work on it every week and have every week for thirty years, and uh, I I love it. I have spent. Uh, 45 minutes to an hour and a half with 550 families who have bought houses and I've had the privilege of, of handling all the closings. And so I, um, uh, uh, all the, those experiences were mostly with African American families that were buying homes and they were buying their first home. And usually it was the first home in, in, in any generation, first homeowner in any generation in that family. And so I made a connection to black people through that. And, and yet um, I d didn't have any idea um, what institutional racism looked like at that time. I also had no idea that those same people were going to be followed by the police, pulled over for things that I did on a daily basis and, and had no problems with. Uh, followed in grocery stores. Um, I, I'm sure you know, some of your audience won't, but Harry Pickens is about a six foot seven African American man. Uh, the, the walking embodiment of, of the Buddha and Christ, if there is one in our community. And uh, Harry Pickens uh, told me that he gets followed when he goes into grocery store. Man. And, and so, you know, I heard stories like that and, and yet I, I still didn't really um, I, I fully understand it. Um, we had a, you know, 2008, we have a black president, 2012, he's reelected. I'm going along in my life thinking that we're mostly in a post-racial society. One other quick story, uh, shortly after that, I, I attended the Simmons College, which is an HBCU, a historically black, black college um, uh, and university here in Louisville. And Sadiqa Reynolds, who is the um, CEO and president of the Louisville Urban League, gave the commencement speech. And I was there with a white friend, and we were among a handful of white people in the audience. The, probably 98% of the folks that were there were black. And she, in the commencement speech, was communicating to the audience that she, ex that she um, experienced racism on a daily basis. And one of the things I love about being in a black church when, the, when I've had an opportunity is that they, folks, um, express their feelings back to the person who's presenting in affirmations, vocal affirmations. And so everybody in that audience was with her. Everybody in that audience knew that that what she was saying was true because they had personally experienced it themselves. And I remember walking away from that thinking all the white people I know, even open-minded liberal, you know, uh, uh, white people who think that uh, we are in a, postly, in a, in a mostly post-racial society need to hear and witness what I just heard and witnessed to understand but that is uniquely the perspective of a white person and the polar opposite experience of a black person in, in America today. Yeah, the, some, of the, some of the voices that have been speaking uh, over the last several months, you know, uh, make this point very clearly, you know, that racism is not a black problem and racism is not a white black problem. Racism is a white problem. Yes. And, uh, you know, the, I, and John, I, it seems like, you know, one of the challenges here is that 
privilege, no matter what kind of privilege you're talking about, almost always is blind to itself. If privilege yes. has a hard time seeing itself. And so it's, it's just hard for white people to see this, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, yeah. It, it is. It's really hard. And I think it's really hard because we don't experience it on a daily basis. It, it, it got me saying, I've got to learn more about what I've been missing. You know, I've got to figure out why their experience is so different than mine, because it's it's obviously shared. And so it's not a, an anomaly. And I need to understand why. And so I started reading books like The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein, uh, uh, Michelle Alexander's uh, The New Jim Crow. Uh, you know, these are books that talk about systemic racism and why there is such disparity of treatment between blacks and whites today. And in The Color of Law, um, Richard Rothstein, you know, documents in, in very great detail how the government got involved uh, to, to uh, institutionalize a system of white supremacy in the United States. And in Michelle Alexander's, I mentioned that book because that's another one that really woke me up was, was this school to prison pipeline uh, that, that our obsession with law and order has allowed us to systematically wholesale, in a wholesale fashion, uh, put black people in prison for crimes that they should be uh, not in prison for, for the most part. If anything, should, you know, drug use, for instance, should be a health crisis rather than a, you know, uh, something that sh they should be imprisoned over. But anyway, back to your point, you know, for me, and I think it's true for most white people, we need some education before we get to some understanding. You know, I'm a, I'm a firm believer that it goes like this. You have education, education leads to understanding, but only after you have understanding can you then have compassion. And then after you have compassion, then hopefully that leads to action. But it starts at the beginning with education because we're not taught that, you know, the, 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 the textbooks that we used, especially my age and your age, the textbooks that we used in, in grade school and high school uh, presented stories that are false narratives in terms of the way that black people have been treated since 1619 when they were first brought here. I mean, did, did you learn that over a million black uh, people died on the middle passage over to the United States? Of course you didn't, you know? Did you learn that, that after the Civil War uh, it, 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 and, and the uh, uh, black people were emancipated, that there was a system of convict leasing where you would, where a police, you know, a, a, a local a police, off, police officer would arrest a black person for a loitering or for not having a job or some, you know, made up crime and then, and then was leased out to a farmer and worked as a sharecropper essentially back into slavery. You didn't learn that and I didn't learn that. And, and so, you know, it, we we didn't learn the truth of, of the way that black people have been treated. So so to some extent, we can kind of forgive ourselves for not having reacted more strongly because we were never taught this. Um, but I think that what's happening now in on the streets and what's happening in this country and really around the world is that people can no longer say I didn't know. And the reason for that is because of education of us as to the way black people are treated on, on the streets and in their cars and in their homes by police officers. And the only reason we're getting that education is because of technology and the technology of cell phones in particular, where people are filming. And you know, right. and, and, and you looked at, uh, at, at, at when George was murdered, and, you know, I, I asked Sadiqa Reynolds, I said, why do you think that all of a sudden people are awake? And she said, she said, the look in his eye, you know, mm -hmm. the look in that police officer's eye as he had his, his knee on, on George Floyd's carotid artery and, and, and kept it there for a full three and a half minutes after he was unconscious, you know, staring at cell phones that he knew were recording it because he knew, and he knew, you know, he was wrong, <laughs> yeah. but he knew historically that he could get away with that because it happened all the time in this country. That's right, that's right. I've heard somebody describe cell phones as truth-telling machines, 
<laughs> no, for the first time, you can't say that never happened because we actually have a picture I, of it now. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that we get this uh, strongly from the black community that, you know, white people just need to educate themselves. And, they, you know, there's yeah. this insistence. You don't need us to be in the room to educate you. All you have to do is read what's available. It's, it's, yes. it's there. It's available. And, and it, will, it will impact you, no doubt. 